Hey, good day, everybody. This is Dave Walker here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Beta SMB Institute, and I'm one of your hosts today. And I have the great pleasure of moderating this session, which is near and dear to my heart, which is basically my website sucks. Now what? And trust me, guys, I was there. I was there in six figures. <laughs> I was there in a very bad way a long time ago, back in 2011 when I launched BizHive. So I, I, I can appreciate for any of you who are sitting here really anxious to hear because you have this sneaking suspicion that, uh-oh, maybe my website doesn't do everything I want it to do. So we've got some great uh, uh, panelists here to, to talk about this. We've got Perch, welcome. Good to have you back. Darren Thanks. Shaw, welcome. Good to have you back. John Lawson, my hero, as always. Good to have you here. So we're going to we're gonna just kind of address some what I'll describe as the 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 big questions of, around that need to get answered if you're really kind of in that space where you're suspicious about your own website. Um, the first one that I'll throw first to you, Kirch, and then we'll go to Darren and then to John. From your perspective, um, you know, when you ask the question of your own website, can this website be saved? You're kind of in that phase of evaluating your fixer upper. What what do you recommend that small businesses use to really evaluate their website right now? Okay. Kirch, so, to you first. Thanks. So I think um, pretty much I have seen websites that should not be should not be fixed that should be thrown away and start over. But I'm going to hope that most of the people who are here don't really want to throw their whole website away. They'd like to figure out, is it possible to fix it? So I like to think about doing three, four things first, and that the first one would be to run a screaming frog um, scan of the thing for to get uh, sort of every as much information about what's there as they can. So the pages, the headings, the keywords, the descriptions, all all of that stuff in place. And then to look at the Google Analytics to see, um, are there errors showing up there? And if there aren't Google Analytics, to hurry up and get that in there. Uh, even if you can't quite understand it, if you have it there, maybe somebody else will understand it. And um, then I would run a page, page speed information, because if the rest of the stuff on the website isn't right, uh, the page speed is kind of doesn't really matter that much. So that's, you know, sort of where I like to start with evaluating and then taking all that information and figuring out how to use what you have and move things around. Darren? So then over, so then sorry, over to you, Darren. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So um, I think, okay, you've got a website. When was it built? You know, what was it built in? This is, this is kind of where you're going to start. Like, all right, I hired my nephew to build this site in 1997, and uh, he 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 built it in Cold Fusion or something like that. You're gonna have to throw that out. No one's gonna work on that site at this point. Um, if it was built in the last few years on modern technology, then I think it may be savable. I think you may be able to, like, let's say it was built in WordPress. Now. Just the fact that it's WordPress doesn't mean it's savable because WordPress itself could, a WordPress site can be an absolute Frankenstein of plugins, garbage, and unsupported stuff that doesn't really exist, exist anymore, is not being used anymore. And so you really do need to evaluate what is standing this website up. Um, and it's very hard for a small business owner who doesn't understand the technology to be able to answer that question. It's like, what are, how do I know if I can if I can use this site or not? So the first thing you want to know is what is my site built in? And there's a there's a really great website called Built With that you can run your URL in. It'll tell you what technology your site is built on, and then you would give that to a developer. Um, but another big question is, you know, like does it make sense for you to to try and build, or let's say you're just gonna redesign your website. It's like, okay, yeah, I know the design is out of date. It doesn't have good marketing. The content is garbage. There's no, no, no calls to action. It's not selling my business. It's time for a refresh. So that's where you're facing this question of new website or just revamp the existing website. And so you may be smarter and it may be a lot more cost effective at this point. If you built your site like five to 10 years ago, 
there are new technology options now for building websites that are so easy. Like you may be smarter to say if it's just a, a small business brochure website that you're just going to say, I'm going to ditch that and now I'm going to build a new site in Squarespace or I'm going to use Wix because they have these templates. They have a system for you to be like, I'm a plumber. Oh, look, I've got 12 different really good looking plumber uh, site options I could go with. And so you could do that, be up and running in a matter of days for a cost of 20 bucks a month rather than spending you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars to get a developer to painfully try and pick apart your old site, put a new site on top of it. And so those are the kind of questions you really need to assess. Can it be saved? It depends on what it's built in and it depends on also some budgetary re uh, restrictions. If you've got a big budget, you're like, company has grown a lot in the last 10 years, you've got $5,000 to throw at it, well, the world's your oyster, you can now hire a great web development company. But I can tell you, they're all gonna wanna ditch it. Every developer is gonna wanna be like, I'm not, I'm not digging into the crappy old code that your previous developer did, because wow, that's a mess. I'm gonna, <laughs> I don't wanna do it my way. And so if you are a small business owner with the budget, you're probably gonna build a brand new site through a new development company. Or if you don't have the budget, then you might really wanna consider going with something like, or a Wix that has the templates for you. And I wouldn't worry too much about the SEO concerns and small business. If you're not doing any like fancy technical stuff, uh, complicated e-commerce, then uh, Squarespace or Wix, I, I think still works just fine. Anyway, so it's kind of long-winded. Uh, as a no, not long-winded at all. And a great and a terrific answer that I, that I for one really appreciate. Hey, uh, Kirch, we need, to, we need to invite Brenda into the Cool Kids Club and explain to her exactly actually what Screaming Frog is and what it does. <laughs> Screamingfrog.com is a, an SEO spider that will crawl through your site and pull out all of the uh, you know all of the pages that you have, uh, the URL, the title of the page, the how many words are in the article, how many le characters are in the title. If you're using H1s and H2s, what are they? Uh, when was it last updated? I mean, it's a huge, huge collection of stuff. And I think it will do up to, I don't know, I'm going to make this up, 500 pages for free. Um, there's also a paid version that gives you a little bit more information. But um, in, it, it shows you internal and external links, which ones are broken, both ones on your site that are broken and ones that go to other sites that are broken. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a really useful, valuable um, piece of software. It's screamingfrog.com. Awesome. And we just uh, posted the link in our, our chat. And Brenda, you are now officially part of the club. So um, <laughs> another question that came in, and Darren, I'll direct this to you before we go on to John. And that was specifically, um, Julie asks, I rebuilt in Wix, but lost my search ranking after 17 years, years of enjoying first page landing with my new WordPress site um, or, or my from my old WordPress site. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, we've all certainly heard those stories. Can you, first of all, explain why that happens? And second of all, are there any remedies to avoid it happening? Yeah, I saw that in the chat and I was, I was, I was wanted to address that. I'm glad you raised the question. So if, if you say lost, like you went from, you know, ranking number one to ranking number four, then there, that, that can indicate some content changes that maybe happened. With a redesign, oftentimes the the content gets dropped in the in the process. Be like, oh, we were too text heavy before. We just want to be all images now. Let's say it's a photography site or something like that. That, that would definitely have a negative impact during the redesign process. But if we're talking about falling off the map completely, then I would need to sort of dig into it. Um, I would say that perhaps you've got a brand new domain, and so you've lost all of what you built on the old domain. The new site is not structured. Sometimes you may be launching with uh, the site set to no index. I've seen that happen many times. You're building a brand new website, so you've got it set to no index. And then you launch it, and you forgot to take off the no index tag, and now Google says, oh, well, I guess we're not including this site in our results because it's, it's set to no index. So that is one thing that I would check into. Um, I will tell you that Wix can absolutely uh, rank. 
So I've seen lots of sites ranking well with Wix. Um, I, can I throw something in here? Yeah. I wonder if in, in the switch over from WordPress to Wix, if the headings didn't didn't get rebuilt as actual headings, but just were styled to look bigger. And that, that would be that a problem mm -hmm. um, with the new site as well. Yeah, and I see your comments there. Uh, Julie, thank you for adding additional details. So you didn't fall off the map completely. You just went from page one to page three. Stayed on the same domain. So um, page redirects, so if your page URL st structure changed in the process, that could have an impact if you didn't redirect the old pages to the new pages. Most likely, though, I think it's a matter of page structure and content. So if your text stayed exactly the same, then it would it is surprising to me that uh, you would have dropped so far. I would love to see what did the old site look like and what did the new site look like, and then I could kind of look at the two and be like, oh, I see what happened. But uh, it's really hard to diagnose without being able to look at the two the two versions of the site. What was the before and what was the after? But SEO generally comes down to um, you know content, what is the text on your pages, uh, and do you have the keywords in the right spots? And so if that changed during the cha changeover to the new site, then that is, uh, that's where things can happen. In fact, it's a really great thing to bring up because if you are thinking about this, my website sucks, I need a new website, you gotta be really careful when, when you do launch that new website. You have to think about what is the SEO I have in place now and make sure that that's carried over. And that really falls under title tags, headings, page copy, really getting making sure that you're maintaining some of those things when you launch the new site. Great answers, guys. And thanks for digging deep on that because I do think it's a, a cautionary tale. Um, John Lawson, from your <laughs> unique perspective, um, I want to circle back to that same question, which is when you're kind of looking over the shoulder of someone who's asked you, hey, John, does my website suck? What are the things running through your mind or when you really sit down and really evaluate a website that indicate that, as, as Darren said, you know, you kind of have this choice of going, you know, tear down, rebuild or modify. What, what, what are some of the things that cross your mind, the questions you ask? The question, number one question is not can it be saved, but should it be saved? Because uh, just like this one person <laughs> uh, Julie is talking about, you know, um, 17 years of backlinks and things like that could have been lost. And so maybe it's not the re-indexing that's the issue, but it's all the uh, link love that you've had after being there for 17 years. So that's when it becomes like, what should we do? Should we report, what should, should we replatform or should we stay on this platform and dig in and update the you know the framework and leave the content where it is um but uh to get back to some of the things that i would look at um there's a couple of tools that i'll throw in there with the frogging one it's like a website grader by hubspot you can literally just put your url into website grader and um it'll go through and do some performance testing It'll give you a score for your SEO, whether or not your pages will show up in uh, mobile and, uh, you know, any security issues that it can find. Of course, this is just a quick overview, but it gives you some idea of where issues are that need to be addressed for your site. Another one that's similar to that is, uh, and, and kind of does a little bit different, but it's the SEO analyzer which is going to go out and check those links that we were just talking about and you'll get some errors uh uh information uh for things that are broken that might avoid you for avoid you is that a right word no that ain't right <laughs> but but that will actually stop you from uh achieving top spots on google uh that is something by neil patel um and if you put his name in an seo you'll find the SEO analyzer. Um, so those are two good tools that help you determine whether or not you need to save this website and is it savable? Terrific, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just, sorry, I got distracted because I'm, I'm finding the Neil Patel link because I wanna put it in chat and I'll do that in a quick, in a quick second. 
Um, let's go on to the, the to the next question because I think that that for a lot of folks, the you know the real issue at hand, why they might be dissatisfied with their website, is that they come to the conclusion that boy, I sure wish my website contributed a lot more directly to my sales. Now that could be any number of things. It could be adding e-commerce. It could be you know, a, a direct link into creating leads for a sales team, whatever. But what are some of the criteria that you use as you really think about a website? And we'll start kind of in reverse order here, John, with you, um, for maximizing the sales impact of your website. What are the things that you um, tell people you really need to do this? You really need to have a clear and defined call to action. And it needs to be singular. All right. Singular call to action. Now you can have secondary calls to action, but the singular call to action and the main one needs to stand out from all the secondary stuff. So that the one thing you want them to do, I was talking to a lady today and she's got a blog, you know, and, and it's like my blog does really well and it drives some traffic. And I look at her blog and all of the uh, uh, calls to action on her blog are to join my list and sign up. I'm like, but don't you want to sell stuff? She's like, yeah, well, then let's have the first call to action possibly going to your number one selling item that uh, would help with what the blog is actually talking about as opposed to, hey, here's my 10 tips. I'm past the tips. I got to the tips just to, you know, by being on your site. That's what I did. Now that you've told me what the uh, solution is, let me go buy. I think sometimes we get way in people's way of buying when we really do want them to buy. Somebody has told us that we need to build these long, drawn out funnels. And that look, the funnel's great when you are trying to get somebody or convince somebody. But once they're already convinced, you need to step out the way and give them a buy button. Most of our stuff doesn't convert simply because we never ask. Ask. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Darren, to you next. Same question. All right. I got opinions here, too. <laughs> um, I, I would start, like, you know, one of the biggest killers and that a lot of people maybe not, aren't even aware of is the negative impact that a bad design can have on your sales. So, if your website was designed in 1997 by your nephew, then uh, you can kiss your sales goodbye because it, that impression that your website gives to your brand, to your company is so important. And so uh, it, it really leads back to the earlier question, like can this website be saved? And if the design is horrible, then it's not meeting your needs. Why do you have a website? You have a website because you want people to learn about your company and call your company and do business with your company. And so design is probably uh, one of the first things that I would look at and it's worth investing in a really high quality modern design. I think there, there's great value there. The next thing I would um, look at is content because the, the content on so many websites is really poorly written. So it's either really thin, like there's, they don't really say much, they don't answer their, the common questions that uh, a prospect would have about the business. Um, and then most content is written from the perspective of we. We do this, we do that. This is another thing we do. That, that whole structure, which is so common, I'd say probably 80% of websites take that approach. Um, you can really flip the table if you, adjust your copy to write towards the benefits for the prospect. It's like, rather than we'll come and clean your gutters, you'll have amazingly clean gutters that will not continue to get leaves in them because we're putting our guide on them. You're, you speak to the benefits of the service or the product that you provide, benefits to the person, those kinds of little tweaks to your actual text copy can have a huge impact on whether or not people decide to contact you. And then the third point I have is making it dang easy for people to contact you. So John already talked about this, that whole thing about a call to action. It's so important and it needs to be 
slap them across the face with it. You got this huge thing on the home page. You got a little box that pops up on the left hand side. You got a big thing in the header with your phone number. I really think a lot of small business websites miss out on this. It's just like you got to dig around to find their phone number. You have to go to the contact page. It should be on every page and it should be in their face. Be like, contact us now. And it's even better if you can um, make your calls to action reflect the content on the page. If you're a plumber, for example, and you provide multiple services, so you do you know, hot water tank installation, or you do drain cleaning, or you do you know, new pipes put in, whatever it is. If you're on the drain cleaning page, it should say, contact us now to unclog your drain. If you're on the hot water tank installation page, contact us now for a hot water installation quote. Like you really want to, your calls to action to reflect what's on the page. And making it really easy to answer a question can really have a huge impact on the conversions you drive from your website. There's a new product on the market, which I'm just in love with. It's called Leadferno, and they haven't even launched yet. But the beautiful thing about this is that it acts like a live chat widget on your website. So I'm sure you've all seen that, where it's like, chat with us now, that little widget that pops up. But Leadferno is genius because it actually, uh, it, it opens a text message. So the beautiful thing about that is, is that when, when a, a customer tries to message me, it, I, it goes text with us. So I press the little button, I start a little text message, I put in my name and mobile phone number and my message, it goes into the Leadferno system. I can respond as the business owner on my desktop, but I'm now texting back and forth with that customer. And what that means is they can leave. They can get in their car and go to the thing. They can text me later. They can contact <laughs> me anytime. They now have direct access to me. It's just a really smart way to do live chat on your website. And when you add those kinds of easy communication, strong <laughs> calls to action, you're speaking to the benefits to the customer, your design looks great, those things all come together to really maximize and improve the sales that you're gonna drive from your website. Uh, great tip, and I saw Leadferno for the first time about two weeks ago, and what I what I especially loved about it was I I, I called it you know the, the the virtual version of a customer walking in front of you as the business owner. Of yeah, course you're going to greet them. Of course you're going to reach out and ask them, may I help you? And that's kind of what Leadferno does, just in kind of a virtual setting on on your website. So Kirch, over to you. Um, the question <laughs> is basically. You want to turn your website into a more valuable contributor to your overall sales and revenue objectives. What are the things that you recommend? Um, I've got three. The first one is have good pictures. Don't put crappy If you're trying to sell something, have a good picture of it. If it means you have to pay somebody to do it, pay somebody. And if it means you need to buy a piece of equipment to have a little light box on your desk and be able to control what it looks like, do that because nobody wants to buy something they can't really see. That's the first thing. The second thing is don't use, consider calling me. People do what they are told to do. If you say, consider this, I considered it, I'm not gonna do it. No, consider, do it, just do it. I was one time <laughs> walking from a, an event in the night, uh, I was talking on my cell phone and a guy comes up to me and he says, get off the phone. I was talking to my husband. I said, oh, I have to, I have to go now. And I hang up. And then he never said anything. He never said, give me your phone. He never said, give me your purse. He never said anything. I'm just yelling at him in my best mad mother voice. And he finally just walked away. So consider it. No, don't consider it. Just do it. And the third one that I just learned about today is if you're selling stuff, you have to have a return policy showing on every page. Just talk to a friend of mine who has a, a pretty significant Shopify site. And evidently when the pandemic came, uh, Google said, well, you, you can turn that off now because of the pandemic. And then she got distracted by stuff and she, they, they took her off, off the merchant's place. Now, uh, what do you call it? Um, organic search still was fine. But in that, uh, in that box of pictures of, you know, you can buy this, you can buy this, you can this, she got kicked out because she didn't have the return policy and they told her that's what happened. So. Get a return policy. Okay. Um, so then uh, I guess I'm going to circle back around, John, to you. And let's answer this question from the perspective of 
adding e-commerce to your website. I mean, we talked generally about how to turn your website into more of a selling engine. You just got finished doing a session on e-commerce, e what you call 10101, which I love. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, give us some tips, and then each of you, uh, Darren and Kurt, if you guys could think about when when thinking about the addition of e-commerce, what are some of the questions to be asked in the context of of rehabbing your website? Okay, um, I'm going to make this real stupid simple because we've talked about content. We've talked about, you know, imagery. We talked about uh, uh, SEO a little bit, but not a whole lot. But here's the thing, the old, old saying, people buy from people that they know, like, and trust, right? So they might know you, they might like you, but your site has to be trustworthy before they ever pull out the credit card. They're not going to give, I know, I know, everybody talks about how people get ripped off, blah, blah, blah. They don't get ripped off on ugly sites, as my friend just said, from 1996 built by your cousin. They are, you know, ripped off on sites that look trustworthy. Your site has to really uh, emulate a lot of trust. People have to feel like when I buy from you, I know I'm going to get what I get. That's why they pulled the, the site down because of the return policy. If I if I have a, uh, you know, I got to jump through 30 different hoops to get my money back, I won't be trustworthy enough to give you my money. So good design is something that must be done to have trust. Having good um, badges, trust badges, still work. If you put one of those old school badges up that says, you know, I'm, uh, a, a trustworthy site based on a third party verification. It actually still works. <laughs> Believe it or not, an 800 number. I never use my 800 number. I just put it up there because people automatically think that you're trustworthy because they've got your phone number and not just any phone number. Pay for an 800 888 866 855, whatever it is. You can go to plenty of sites out there and get one of those for $20 a month, right? That's a trust sign and signal for people to give you money. And then finally, customer testimonials. User-generated content, it just really gives people a trusted feeling. So those things I think you need to think about when you're putting e-commerce into a new site. Kurtz, the question's over to you. Well, first of all, if I I get what you're saying, John, about the 800 number, but it better not be the only number that you got on your on your site, <laughs> because then it looks like, well, maybe you're not even a real person, and that's not so good. Uh, yeah, I I agree with all those things, and I think that making it easy for people to ask you questions and uh and testing, especially when it's new, so you put together a WooCommerce thing, the WooCommerce setup, in the back end is takes a bit of a learning curve to put together. So you want to make sure that whatever you've done, then you've got people who test it and see what happens if I put this in. And when when does the shipping show up? I want to know before I hit that last payment thing, what's it going to cost me to ship it? Because if it's going to cost 20 bucks to send ship a $1 pencil, I'm not buying it. So uh, I think that 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 kind of extra information is is really important to be the testing part of, of it. And sometimes that takes a whole lot longer than you expect, but it's important to do it. Darren, question to you. Sorry, I'm a little delayed in like writing notes and then I gotta <laughs> unmute. Um, uh, so is the question, you know, what is your 2021 digital storefront must have, or we're not getting to that yet. We're just talking about e-commerce. No, it's, it's really, yes, that is the question. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think certainly, um, you know, uh, John and Kirch have already covered uh, basically the, the bulk of the list of what you definitely must have on your website. Things we've already talked about, really good design, great content, good calls to action, an easy way to, for customers to contact you through a, like a lead ferno type uh, chat box. And then, uh, you know, expanding upon some of the things they said, other thoughts that I have that come to mind particularly, you know, we're talking about 2021 and into the future, 
Video, I think, is really key these days. Uh, people are consuming video at a rate uh, much higher than they ever have before, and it, it's almost becoming a must-have, like a standard. It's like when I hit your homepage, if you had a little video from the business owner explaining what you do, those kinds of things really have an impact, and they impact what John had talked about, which is trust. It's like this is a real business. I can see the business owner. Oh, here he is in front of his van about to go and do a job and he's talking about something. I really think that those things play a huge uh, role in um, taking the real world and, and making it digital, um, and making it really easy for people to um, order. Like if you're, if you're going online, as you should be, uh, if you sell any kind of product, going online is huge. And so then you have to think about things like, what is my payment provider? How am I gonna process payments? What is my e-commerce provider? What kind of system am I gonna use for that? And so with the pivot that's happened uh, because of COVID and so much stuff happening online, getting, that, getting the right technology in place uh, is super important. Um, one tip that I love is from uh, a local donut shop. They're kind of like the best donuts in, in Edmonton, which is the city I'm in. And uh, the you know pandemic hit. And I'm like, well, no one's coming in to buy donuts. We're shut down. We actually can't even be open. But they started a delivery service, and they really spun it up fast. They already were using Squarespace as their website, so they hooked in the Squarespace e-commerce, which automatically came with the uh, the payment processing. So that was really easy for them. They just had to fill out an application, and they were up and running with e-commerce. And then they just put their offerings within the system. But then the one thing that they had to solve was delivery. Like, how do you do delivery? And so um, one technology that they use is a system called Rutific. And Rutific takes all of their customers from their orders for the day. So the next day, they, they download a spreadsheet from their ordering system in Squarespace. They upload it into Rutific, and Rutific plans the whole route and optimizes the route so that when they do the drop-offs and they're donut delivery van, it's already optimized. And so they they hooked into those things fast and they were able to pivot quickly. And, you know, they added that stuff to their website really quick. So a website in 2021, if you sell any kind of product, should have an e-commerce component and there's technology out there to, uh, to get that. And, you know, I think John mentioned reviews and testimonials. Those are super important. You still see so many websites that they're not pulling that stuff in. And so you can automate that through software. We have a system called Reputation Builder. We have all, it grabs all your reviews, lets you gather more reviews, and then has a little widget you can put on your website to pull in all of your reviews and, and put them on your website. Because that stuff is a huge trust symbol that can also help convert. So it's, it's another conversion signal. Anyway, those are, those are some additional thoughts. I, I, I thought of two other things while you were talking, Darren. The one thing is, you know, we've been talking about this e-commerce thing as a big, you know, I have a, I have a store. But yeah. if you're selling one thing or nobody's at, like if you're selling training and nobody's going to buy six of them at once, they're going to buy one and then they're going to come back and buy another one. Then using something like a Gravity Forms that will, you know, hook to Square to be allowed or Stripe or PayPal or whatever, so that you can just go, it's really simple, it's a form, you fill out the form, here's my name, my address, here I paid, boom. That's, it doesn't have to be as complicated as a WooCommerce or a Shopify or any of that stuff. It just has to be a way for you to get money from people and, you know, provide the service. Uh, especially, you know, especially if you're selling a service as opposed to selling a thing. And the other thing um, when you do have a store is make sure there's a search function. So if I like this book uh, and maybe I want to see another book by the same guy or another book about the same guy, you have to be able to search the content of your store to be able to see if there's more stuff or if there's even the thing that you want for that you're looking for in the first place. So those two things I would add. Yeah, yeah, I think if, if you oh, do sorry. have a store, you have an actual, like, a whole Place. product inventory, a strong case can be made for Shopify, because Shopify comes with all that. Categories, search function, you know, that that's where you might want to consider Shopify. If that's, if that's just, if, if it's just a store, but if you've got a, a site with stuff and a store, 
part of it. I think then you want to be in, you know, I have a, a museum that has all their museum stuff and they sell stuff in their store. So they have a WordPress site that does tells all the stuff about their museum and they have a store. It's not 5,000 things. It's, you know, 40. Well, let's, say, let's say if you are, you know, a, a personal trainer or you've got yoga, you're going to do a boot camp. You can actually do that on your current site, both shop, uh, Shopify, both uh, Stripe and PayPal have buttons that you can code and then it'll give you a little link that you have to put on your page and it'll add a button to your page for people to give you their payment. And of course, when they give you a payment, they're going to ask for your information. So you can really just do it directly inside of either one of those payment providers and put that on your site with a picture about the new thing that's coming up. Right. No, no store necessary sometimes. I think, I think sometimes we forget that there's plenty of people who are just selling one thing. They don't have a store. They're selling one thing or two things and they don't need to be as complicated as that. So. Yep. Yep. Thank goodness for Stripe and PayPal. <laughs> They right. have and made Square. they've made e-commerce in which one? And Square also um, and has Square, a, right. They have made like e-commerce like stupid simple for mm -hmm. things like that. The time when you need a store is when you like Darren said, when you have multiple items, you want to buy multiple of the multiple, you want to showcase different things. That's when you you know get into a hosted platform. But uh if you're just a you know, small business got uh, just a couple of things you're just selling your book on your speaker site you can do that very easily without right. having to get a store right and venmo yes venmo thank you <laughs> the greatest hits of all payment, payment <laughs> prices, um, so i want to uh, i, I want to i'm going to hit you with a question that wasn't on our our, our list but i think oh, it's I an important one and it's really a bridge off of a question that brian asked um New to the party over the last few years has been the addition of content to the website. And in some cases, it's the blog, and in some cases, it's tutorials or videos. You know, there's a lot of time and energy that continues to be spent, growing spent, on producing content for a website. Um, give us your perspective on where do you play where do you place your priorities as relates to the content that appears on a website when does too much content become too much um when is too little content frankly hurting you and then equally how do you um connect that content you're creating to all the other communication channels out there particularly social media does that i hope that question makes sense um and anyone who it does make sense to is welcome to to jump in and and answer first I'll 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 save my I'll probably be a contrarian, but I'll save mine to the end. Oh, oh then I'll great. go first. <laughs> I'll I'll jump in first. Uh, so I think that a lot of particularly small businesses make the mistake of investing a lot of their content energy in a blog, like or they're writing like top ten tips or whatever. That it's a real shame when you when you look at a a small business website. And they got a blog filled with garbage that no one's ever read. And their service page is just a single page with four bullet points on it. Oh, my God. It's, it, it, it hurts. It hurts to see that because the, you must get your primary website page's content beautifully dialed in before you start wasting any time on top 10 tips for this or how to unclog your drain, how to do this, all this sort of like educational content, that is later. That you, you do that once you have already built out the most absolutely incredible service pages that you've ever seen on the internet. So that means you've got six really solid pages of content. You have beautiful images, you have, uh, frequently asked questions section that is really addressing all of the things that anyone wouldn't have, have questions about, your service, how you deliver that service. Those are the pages that Google is looking at. Google cares a lot about those pages and what you say about yourself. 
and they know what's a blog and what's a service page and those service pages have to absolutely be dialed in before you start wasting time with educational type content on your blog or social or wherever. Um, and so you really got to build those pages with like trust symbols, get review content driving into those pages, keep them regularly up to date. The dividends that that content would pay for your business is through the roof compared to regular pumping out a blog post. Or some people like they'll they'll pay 300 bucks a month for two blog posts a month from some some company. Oh my god, that is it's just a waste of spend. It 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 you could try that after you have absolutely built every possible service page out and <laughs> subservices. So you take Okay, I, I'm a plumber. These are the like five main services, but within each main service, there's these tiny little subservices I do. Those should all be content pages too. And then I think you did raise the question, David, about um, you know interlinking these things. Internal links are super valuable as well. You want your homepage content to have in-content links to each of the primary service pages. And another one that's often neglected is the contact us page. We know that Google actually, particularly in the GMB uh, local algorithm, they look specifically at your contact page. They parse it as a separate page that they look for on your website. And the content you put on your contact us page is very valuable. And it's a real opportunity because 95% of every contact page on the internet for all small business websites is this is our name, address, phone number, and hours of operation. That's all they put on their contact page. But you, the smart listener of this webinar, you will add content to your contact page that explains what you do and internally link that contact, that, that content to the specific pages with more details. And so get that stuff ironed out before you start spending time on all that blog content. I, I think that's great if you have a business website and you're trying to sell stuff. But there's lots of other there's lots of other kinds of websites like membership websites and and uh, you know church websites and that sort of stuff where they want to get people there they want to get people to do all these other things they need to get ranked for SEO they need to do all this other stuff but those sites well yep you're right there's those those however many six or seven or twelve pages that are uh, about the service, what do we do and how do we do it and all that stuff that absolutely every every site has to have. I mean, that kind of information, nobody's going to join if they don't know what you do. So you have to have that. But then the other content that there is may not be a, a for sale thing. It may just be this is what we're doing. This is a car club and we want you to know what's the VIN number on the 1967 Tiger. So you have to have that information. And it's, so I just I, I guess I'm I, I'm sort of speaking up for other people who are here who are not necessarily trying to sell stuff, but they want their website, want to, you know, they want to, is it worth keeping it? Is it doing anything for me at all moving forward? And um, the other thing, the contact page, well, if you have a lot of information, you better have a good search box because if you can't find the information, it doesn't matter if it's there. But the contact page, I've been using that a lot for a lot of people. So you go to the contact page, and if all it is is your name and your address and a box to put stuff in, people don't know how to fill that out. They don't know what 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 would you really? I guess I don't know what to put there, so I won't. So including a collection of I want to know about uh, gutters, I want to know about swimming pools, I want to know about this or that or the next thing, so that people can check those boxes and you have an idea what they're what their uh, information, you know, what do they want to talk to you about, and making sure there's a contact form and not a freaking email address. People get an email address, they send me an email with no subject line, I don't read them. So this, with the contact page, it says that it came from my website, and they all have the same subject line, and then I know that's something I need to be, be sure to pay attention to. That's what so I, I guess basically what, what these guys are saying is it's not a one size fits all. Um, right. And you got to determine where you're at. Are you an informational site that happens to sell products or happens to, you know, want to drive people to your brick and mortar? Maybe that's one thing. Or if you're an e-commerce site, it's kind of a, a different way. So I'm going to go from the e-com standpoint um, that I believe content should be one way. It's not a two way street. Content is there to support your your uh, sales site, 
your e-commerce store. You might have a link to the blog in the top of the store, but after that, I shouldn't see your blog because you, the last thing you want to do is take me away from a sales page to read a damn blog. That is the worst, worst thing I see people doing all the time, all right? Now, flip it around. If you are trying to educate people, then I love the top 10 things. Not only do you do the top 10 things, you make each one of the 10 things their own blog post, their own video, their own social post, right? When people ask you questions, that is an opportunity for you to write long formatted content in the way and in the way that people asked you is going to be the way other people think. It's that old saying of, you know, if, if one person asked the question, 10 other people have the exact same question. So whatever they ask you, use that as the title of the content that you create to answer it. It really helps. So, but yeah, I, I, I like the, uh, what Kurt is saying too. There's two sides to this. You know, I don't think about it that way often. I'm always in my e-commerce brain. <laughs> and that's funny because I'm always in my local business brain. And so uh -huh. I'm totally coming at it from that. Look, I'm a local business and I see right. all the mistakes local businesses are making. Right. So, yeah. And I, I wanted to just touch on you mentioned something about taking like a common question that you get as a business and then building out a really good blog post on that. I love that idea. I think it's really valuable. And I would say link that to your service page too, mm -hmm. back back and forth. Because on the service page, you can have an FAQ section, frequently asked questions, and they just give a little brief answer, and for more details, click okay. here, which goes over to your more detailed page uh, on your blog. And so then you're kind of reaping the rewards of both strategies. So people that are coming in through the home page, learning about what you do, looking at your services, that can lead them over there. And then people that search that specific question in Google might land on that yep. content page and get back over to your service. So I'm gonna actually now read Brian's question that I riffed off of to create the last 10 minutes of conversation, which were terrific. Thank you guys. Um, he asked very specifically, what app will work with your site that can instantly push your website content out to your social media platforms? Is there such a thing? So you write a blog post, you press publish, and boom, it's all over your socials too? Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. I don't know of well, one. Well, honestly, I mean, there are apps, I mean, not even apps, there's plugins that are social plugins. So if that's all you want, when you, when you have the social plugin, it'll add the buttons, and you can just push one of the buttons, and it'll <laughs> push it out. So there you go, if that's what you want to do. But I guarantee freaking to you, nobody will give a damn. So don't even bother. <laughs> if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna create content for the platform that it's on, look, TikTokers, if you will never find a person that is a TikTok star also being a YouTube star and also being a Facebook star. They're different platforms, different audiences, different kind of content. You have to actually create unique content for platforms or nobody will care. Yeah, I can give you a, an example from WhiteSpark's perspective. So uh, I, I've been doing this weekly video series where I produce a video, it's like a how-to video, usually about 10 minutes. We publish that to YouTube, but then we have a social strategy, which is like, this is what the tweet looks like. This is how we share it on Instagram. This is how we share it on Facebook. This is how we put it on LinkedIn. And they're all different because, you know, to John's point, the, they are different platforms and the way you format that message, the what, you know, um, LinkedIn will let us put an image, we have to embed the image, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't link to the post. Like all these different strategies come into play about what would work best. So I do think uh, you're better off, you know, if you've got the, the buttons, you press the button and you format the, the message for each platform. I am so excited that I can answer this question with <laughs> an actual an actual company. Um, and I'm proud to say that we showcased them two years ago as part of our innovation showcase at our best SMB conference. Um, okay. The company is called Lately, and I'm posting the link right now in the site. And we use them all the time. What they have built 
is an artificial intelligence that scans your content. And I mean any content, not just text content, but even video content. And then produces through, the, through artificial intelligence as many tweets or posts or um, Facebook posts or LinkedIn posts as you would like. And then it actually schedules them to be wow. published on once it links into your social media sites. For those who are heavy content users like we are, because we are a membership driven site and very much informationally driven, this is a godsend for us because it literally takes, it, it took something that was hours and hours and hours of work to convert a lot of content into the frequency of tweets, the frequency of posts, the free, frequency of Facebook posts that we wanted to make and, and literally made it really, really, really easy. There's another one that I'll provide called Up Content. And if you find yourself in a, as a business wanting to publish other people's content because you want to share news, um, again, something we do all the time in, a, in our membership site, but even for you, um, Felicia, I think you're opening up a garden center. If you wanted to share lots of different um, videos and or content out there on the web, that was um, relevant to gardening or relevant to seasons or, or whatever, you can use up content to do a crawl of the web and bring you back all of the content associated with specific keywords um, that you can then scan and say, oh, that looks really great. I think my customers would really appreciate that or not. So I'll provide the link to, to both of these um, because I think that, you know, honestly, it's, it's, there is a lot of stuff that's coming out there that is now really, really expediting the use of of content in in websites that I think that I'll evangelize and say everybody should at least give these two a look and um, see what they can do for you. So with that, we're... that lately looks amazing. Sending that to my social it, team. It right is, now. and it. And... <laughs> It's um, it's it's uh, it, it, it once you really kind of get into it and it starts to spit back the spit back the magic, you're kind of in awe. You're kind of yeah. like, what? <laughs> how did you know it how do much that? it is? They don't have pricing on their website. So it starts at um, like three fifty and up. Oh yeah, I got it. Oh, it's pretty pricey. Pretty pricey. It, but it's yeah. but from a time saving standpoint, at least for us, it's very much worth it. For so sure. I think it'd be great again, for guys, we're we're gonna we have a hard stop here at 4:55, but okay. um, Central Time. But thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. Uh, hopefully, everyone who attended um, found great benefit from it. Um, for those of you who want to stick around for a next session, you really don't need to do anything. We'll but we'll roll right into the next session. Um, and then for all of you, we've um, we've recorded all of our sessions, these sessions, and within the next 48 hours. We'll post the links to them on our website in the session descriptions um, for uh, that are in, within the agenda for the event itself. So thank you all very much for coming, and thank you uh, panelists for absolutely great stuff this last hour.